All right, so um, today I want to talk about two practices, uh, single parameter noting and binary noting, and just give you a little bit of a background on these practices, and then also set up the practices by talking about what, um, what we're going to explore in the practice, which has to do with the experience of craving and the intensity of craving moment to moment. And then also the experience of lack or lacking uh, and what it's like um, to lack and what it's like when there's nothing lacking. And um, first, let me just say uh, a little bit about how this practice came about. So this, um, these two practices um, were developed by Kenneth Folk uh, around the same time he was developing the social noting approach initially. So this was part of this sort of initial creative um, kind of explosion. And the single parameter noting practice, in very simple terms, it's a practice where you take a single experience, often a mind state, and you essentially, moment to moment, uh, add on top of, of your noting of that particular mind state the level of intensity uh, that you're experiencing with it. And here, to do that, we'll use uh, what's called the Likert scale. Um, this is a simple zero to five, uh, five point scale that's used uh, for a lot of different research purposes. Um, and and it, it, it's, it's a very generally helpful scale because it's kind of, it's small enough, you know, it's small enough that we're not having to kind of think a lot about what the number is. It's not like from zero to a hundred or zero to 10. Uh, we can kind of keep it fairly simple, not have to spend a ton of time analyzing our experience. But there's enough of a kind of, uh, range there that that we can actually describe with a little bit more precision you know, the intensity of, of what it is that we're noting um, when i first learned this from kenneth we, we used uh, a version uh, as the kind of primary thing to explore the single parameter to note and then we're, we're noting again from zero to five so in that practice it was a uh, zero version or a version one, a little bit of a version and a version two. Okay, now I'm starting to feel some aversion. A version three, stable, solid aversion. A version four, okay, now I'm really aversive, maybe even pissed or angry. A version five, okay, full-blown rage. <laughs> and so you can kind of see, however that is for you, that scale, whatever is true for you, maybe rage isn't five, maybe it's just anger. Um, for me, rage is usually a version three. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go from there. Um, but here we're going to explore craving, the experience of craving in this practice. And we're going to look at, uh, on a scale of zero to five, how much craving is present in any given moment. Uh, and then in the binary noting practice, um, what we're going to do is we're going to turn this gradient scale into a binary. So, um, Instead of there being zero to five, it's zero or one, right? In a binary, zero or one. Uh, now, zero is the same in both practices. So if you're noting that there's zero craving, that's also equivalent in the binary practice where we're noting lacking or nothing lacking to nothing lacking. Uh, we're treating them as being equivalent. Uh, in the practice that Kenneth taught originally, aversion, single parameter noting, and then the binary note that would go along with this is problem. No problem. So the idea is if there's zero aversion, there's no problem. Uh, if there's some amount of aversion, there's some amount of a problem, and thus there's a problem. Um, so here, if there's, crave, if there's zero craving, then there's nothing lacking. We're not trying to, to get anything. We're not wanting anything or, or moving towards something or desiring something other than what's here. There's zero craving, uh, nothing lacking. If there's some amount of craving, even if it's ever so subtle, um, then there's something lacking. There's lacking. And, and in the binary practice, we'll simply collapse the possibilities of, of, of all the spectrum and all these different things we could note to just one of two things um, with the intention of kind of exploring this polarity, this binary in our experience. And, and what is the relationship between craving and lack? And why here am I using the term lacking exactly? Um, well, part of the reason I'm, I'm using this term and I like this term is that it was put forth by one of my teachers, uh, David Loy, in his book, Lack and Transcendence, 
as a, um, an interesting translation of the Buddhist term dukkha, which is uh, uh, it's obviously typically translated as suffering. Uh, that's how most uh, English uh, translations uh, render it. Uh, but here, David proposes the term lack or lacking for dukkha. And, and this for him is an attempt to bridge the gap between some of these Eastern spiritual traditions, especially the Indic ones, and the Western psychoanalytic tradition. Um, and, and for him, lacking is a term that helps to kind of bridge the gap between these different um, paradigms between the West and the East. And so uh, I'm, I'm always interested in things that kind of bridge the gap between things. That's, that's one of the reasons I like, I like this translation. Um, and in terms of the relationship between lack and craving, and, and a little bit more on what David, I think, is pointing to with lack, I wanted to read a couple of quotes from, from this book, Lack and Transcendence. Firstly, he says, uncomfortable with our sense of lack today, we look forward to that day in the future when we will feel truly alive. So here I think this is a good description of the relationship between craving and lack. Uncomfortable with our sense of lack today, you know, we feel this gnawing sense of lack, there's something lacking, whatever that is, you know, some sense of some, there's maybe a lack of pleasant sensation, there's a lack of purpose, a lack of meaning, a lack of um, um, connection. Um, there can be any number of things which feel lacking. And out of that sense of lack, we look forward to some point in the future where it's going to be different. We, and, and that looking forward is a kind of craving. Like we want something to be different than it is. Um, and so this is the kind of direct relationship you could say between lack and craving. When there's lacking, there is craving. Now, where does that sense of lack come from? Um, well, again, this is from David's perspective. Um, according to my interpretation of Buddhism, he writes, our dissatisfaction with life derives from a repression even more immediate than death terror, um, even more immediate than the fear of death, the suspicion that I am not real. The sense of self is not self-existing, but a mental construction which experiences its groundlessness as a lack. Let me read that last sentence again. The sense of self is not self-existing, but a mental construction, which experiences its groundlessness as a lack. So, so this analysis sort of points to the, the, the source of lack being our own experience of our own groundlessness, our, uh, the sense that we are groundless, um, this intuition that things are groundless, and that includes us. Uh, and the response to that sense of me being groundless is a feeling of lack, is a feeling of instability, of uncertainty, of untrustworthiness. Like, oh, life is not... If, 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 if I'm not stable, then how can I trust life? Um, there is this sort of lack of purpose, lack of meaning, lack of stability, lack of ground beneath us. When we're identified with this mental construction, <laughs> uh, when we're identified with anything at all, um, that sense of lack, you could say, comes with identification. Um, because as soon as we become um, identified with anything that's changing, um, it's a threat. It's a threat. You know, it's a threat to us. Um, and so why is it a good idea to investigate this or look at this? Um, well, because um, this is the source of a lot, or say maybe all of our existential <laughs> suffering or all of our existential pain comes from from not really being able to relate to this lacking, to um, to trying to fill the lack, to fill the void, craving something we don't have, to pushing away the things that we think are, are problematic, the experiences, the people, the situations that we think are causing that sense of lack. We try to get rid of them. You know, instead of seeing the deeper causes, 
We try to fix it at the, at the, at the level of, of our conditioned experience. We try to rearrange the, the deck chairs on the Titanic instead of plugging the hole. Um, and then when we can't uh, get something else that's better or push away the things that we think are causing the problem, then we usually just employ the strategy of, uh, of, of avoiding it altogether or being confused about the situations. Like, I don't know what's happening, um, also known as delusion. And these three strategies uh, from a Buddhist standpoint, also often called the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots, these are three ways in which we um, continue to uh, thrash against groundlessness. We continue to, to um, try to um, get out of, of our fundamental situation, which is that we were born and we'll die. Um, everything which is born dies. And so um, how do we become more okay with that situation, how do we actually accept the reality of our lives? Well, we have to look directly at the cause, the root of our suffering, of our sense of lack, that groundless experience. And to look at it directly often means looking at the reaction to it, the reaction to groundlessness. Um, so much of our pain comes from the reacting to our transient nature. Um, so with these practices, we'll be um, investigating directly um, our sense of lack, and in, in, in this case, the way that we experience craving and how it changes moment to moment, so that we can better understand our existential situation and, and, and to come more uh, into a kind of honest relationship with, with how it is.